Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to part two of our security webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about Microsoft 365 software development lifecycle best practices. That's a mouthful for a, uh, a title, and it's it's going to be a pretty techy session today. So I hope you're buckled up and ready, and uh, we're going to dive right in. So let me start with some introductions here. If you haven't attended one of my webinars before, my name is Peter Carson. I'm the president of Extranet User Manager and also an Office Apps and Services Microsoft MVP. Uh, contact details are here and we'll be sharing the deck and a recording after the session as well. So we'll send out a, a email response to everybody that registered. Um, if not end of day today, then first thing tomorrow. Um, we'll go pretty quick on Extranet User Manager background. Don't want to make this salesy. I mean, we've been around for well over a decade now uh, building Extranet solutions for clients. Started as sort of bespoke one of solutions and then evolved into a product. And then as the cloud came along five years ago or so, you know, really jumped on the Azure AD B2B side and, and the cloud side of things as part of that as well. And today our business is predominantly in the cloud. Most of our implementations um, involve 365 rather than on-premises, although we still have some, some work in the on-premises world as well. You know, clients around North America, Europe, a um, few others spread further apart from there. Okay, so we've done introductions. Let's do a, a quick overview of what we're gonna cover for the next hour here. Um, we're going to start with a background on what continuous delivery is. And if you're not familiar with that term, don't worry, because that's one of my first tasks is to, to educate and give you some background on, on what that means. Uh, we'll move into to managing multiple environments. You know, how do you how do you run proper development, test, production environments, however many you, you feel is appropriate for your organization. And then we're going to dive right into a number of scenarios. So the first one we're going to use is our external user manager website itself. Um, you know, not so much the contents of the website, but really how we manage that project and how we um, use Azure DevOps and software development lifecycle um, around that project. We'll then flip into our open source teams provisioning. Um, it's got a little different flavor, some different components there. So we're going to get into things like logic app workflows and Azure automation, PowerShell runbooks, and, and how you package and, and distribute those in that scenario. Uh, third scenario, we're going to dive into Power BI. Um, you know, if you're not familiar with Power BI, it's an awesome dashboard and, and reporting tool. Um, same thing applies. How do you move that from a dev test prod environment point of view, and, and how do you provide some automation around that? And then the last uh, scenario is actually just talking about automated testing, which really you know, needs to be a part of all of these here. Um, I don't have specific scenarios on all of these, but I'll take you through some work that we're doing on that side and where we're going there. Um, next up, we have a quick Microsoft Forms poll. Uh, poll. So Logan's chatted the, uh, the URL into the Q&A section, so you can pick it up from there. You can also just use your camera, um, open your camera app on your phone. Don't actually take a picture, just kind of move it in and out until the QR code scans for you and it'll be taken to the, uh, to the poll. It's pretty straightforward here. Let me pull it up on my screen here. Just, you know, some contact information first and then just curious from a, um, you know, technology that you're using, what sort of platforms are you currently doing development in? If you don't know what some of these things are, don't worry about it. Just don't check them off from that point of view. Um, do you currently have multiple Microsoft 365 environments? You know, how do you manage that? We're going to talk about how you, you know, best practices and what you should be doing on that side. And what sort of tools do you use today um, from a development platform point of view and, and from a sort of project management point of view? And then if you'd like us to, to follow up, feel free to check that off. If you say not right now, we'll respect that and, and not annoy you from a follow up point of view. So love to have you take a minute, even as we're going through the session here and, and just fill that in. If you'd rather pay attention and come back to it later, uh, by all means do that. The, the link will be open and available from there. OK. Hey, Peter, now would be a good time to go full screen. Uh, thank you, because of course I forgot that. Hang on a sec here. Switch that and send that live. There we go. No, nope. <laughs> That's not the full screen you meant, was it? Uh, let's try this again. How's that? Looks good. Okay. So yeah, uh, I wanted to start by uh, defining what continuous delivery is and what a continuous delivery pipeline is. It was actually a really good article. I was doing some surfing around, seeing you know who had some good blog posts and explanations. Um, scaled Agile framework is is one that kind of bubbled up to the top of my results and seemed to do a good job of explaining it. It's really part of the lean and, and agile uh, methodology. So if you're not familiar with that, this idea of 
dividing your work up into sprints, you know, typically two week for us. Sometimes we run three week sprints and, and starting with the sprint planning and saying, hey, you know, let's get the business owners and the technical team together, sit down and do a planning session and figure out, um, you know, what's in our product backlog, prioritize that and then figure out how much of that we can achieve in this sprint and then go through a, a continuous uh, development phase through that sprint, culminating in a, a sprint demo at the end of that. And really the tooling that we're going to talk about here today really supports that agile methodology, uh, but it's not exclusive to that. If you're running a waterfall project where you, you know, do sort of a traditional requirements gathering and functional spec up front before anybody writes a, a line of code and then go into you know big long multi-month kind of development process. I'm not actually a fan of running projects that way, but what I'm going to talk about here today applies equally well in that scenario. And, and the idea is that there's sort of four parts to a continuous delivery pipeline. There's continuous exploration, which is kind of exploring uh, product backlog and ideas and architectures, uh, not just from a technology point of view, but from a product planning point of view. Um, and that kind of feeds the, the, the product backlog and, and into the agile methodology. Then we get into the center of the continuous integration, which is really the, you know, the develop, build, test, and I'm going to go into more detail in a second. And then the continuous deployment, how do we deploy that out into to our um, you know, test environments and ultimately into our production environment. So if we drill in a little deeper into the continuous integration side of things, um, so we've got you know, the, the development, whether that's opening up Visual Studio and writing code or whether it's doing things like defining workflows and logic apps, we're going to talk about all those scenarios. Um, and there's typically some sort of build process and some testing that happens. You know, you'd want the developers that are doing the individual development to do their own unit and functional testing as part of their work within their local environment. And, and ultimately they're going to check that into a source control repository and, and we're going to want some deployment that does some automated testing and moves that into different environments. And then ultimately, you know, I've got a staging area that has sort of a live and idle and I'll show you some cool things in Azure App Services that let you support that. And, you know, really these buckets belong over here. They're more part of the, the continuous deployment and release on demand where you say, hey, I'm, I'm ready for that to, to go live from that point of view. So swap the, the live and the idle ones and your, your new release becomes your live site from that point of view, your live application. Now, a big premise of this is that you've got uh, more than just your production environment to work on. And that's a really important point that I want to make here. So if we go to our, our next slide, uh, this idea of managing multiple environments and, and we're big proponents of having completely separate tenants for your different environments. So your development work, you've got your own uh, Microsoft 365 subscription, it's got its own Azure AD underneath that and it's completely separated from the production environment. You may have additional environments. Uh, we've had clients go as high as five or six different environments. So maybe they've got a, a development, a, a QA, a user acceptance testing, a staging, a pre-production, and then a production. Um, that's overkill for most projects, but you know, at a bare minimum, having a development and production, and then ideally maybe having a QA environment as a third is, is sort of best case scenario from that point of view. You know, and it's not about just carving out a little piece of your production environment saying, hey, I'm going to have a, you know, a sandbox site collection over here that I'm going to do some SharePoint development in and then when I'm ready, I move it into the, the main part of the site collection. It doesn't give you that isolation. There's things that uh, you may find that you need to do in SharePoint, like setting up um, search schema and things like that, that are global to the tenant and you can't can't do them just in that one site collection. You need a completely separate environment. Likewise, a lot of the work that we're going to be talking about um, has things like service principles and, and things set up in Azure AD. Again, you don't want to be doing that in your production Azure AD. You want to have a completely separate Azure AD. It's not just from a separation point of view. Um, it's also that your developers that are working in this team here, you want them to have unfettered access to this development environment and you, you shouldn't be doing that in your production. You shouldn't be giving you know, a dozen developers on the project global admin access into your production Azure AD. That's a big no-no from a security point of view, but you don't want them to limit it. So, so allowing them to just do everything they want to do here in this development environment and then having gates and stages that move it through those environments is the key part of the, the context here. Now you can sign up for free developer subscriptions. We put the link in here um, so you can create your own Microsoft 365 subscription. It'll have its own Azure AD tenant underneath that. It's associated with the developer. So what you do is you create a developer account with Microsoft and then you ask for 
a development subscription under that account. The, the challenge is they do expire. So if you don't use them, um, I don't know if the current is 90 days or, or six months, but basically, you know, if they're left unused, they will expire and get deleted um, by Microsoft. And if you spend a lot of time getting your development environment stood up, you don't want to run the risk of, of you know, you finish the project and, and you've kind of parked it and then six months, 12 months later, it comes back into the project cycle and you're doing some major updates to it and you find out that your development environment is gone and you've got to set it all up again. That would really suck from that point of view. So for, for almost all of our clients and even for our own um, non-prod tenants, we tend to use uh, you know, very simple one, two user kind of tenants and we'll pay the, the five or six dollars for a um, Microsoft 365 essentials or business essentials, you know, sort of the, the minimum cost subscription in order to do that. And that 10 bucks a month is a, a small price to pay to, to have an environment through there. And you would do that for each of yours. So if you're running three environments like this picture here, um, you would you would have a couple of paid users for development and a couple of paid users for QA. Now that's not to say that your development staff um, all need to have licensed user accounts in each of these environments. In fact, we encourage you not to do that. We only have a few there that are used for some things like the, the Microsoft 365 admin that you have to use a, a local account for. It doesn't actually have to be a licensed account. It can be an unlicensed account. But basically the bulk of the work um, you actually use your production credentials for. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, one is um, just from a, a browser profile or in private point of view. If I look at us, I mean, we're maybe a, a, an extreme case because we're a consulting organization. We have lots of clients. We have lots of non-production tenants for projects for those clients. You know, at any one time, we might have a, a dozen active projects on that may have two or three non-prod environments. You know, suddenly you're up to 30 or 40 different tenants to manage credentials in, it becomes a nightmare. Um, so what we do is, is we set up groups in our production tenant and we basically have this PowerShell script that we've created that, that looks at some SharePoint lists and says, hey, I'm going to sync um, the users that belong to these groups that need access to this non-prod environment over as guest users into this non-prod Azure AD. And we're going to create um, matching groups to the ones that are in the production tenant over in here, and we're going to put the guests into those groups. What this means is, um, let's say for a minute, I didn't put on this diagram, but let's say I had a SharePoint over in this non-prod environment, and I wanted to access that site collection as a production user here. What we do is, is we pick the appropriate group. Maybe we've got a developers group here, and we make it site collection administrator on that site collection. Now, anybody can come in. They don't have to open a different browser profile. They don't have to do in private sessions. It doesn't mess things up from that point of view. And they just start accessing that um, SharePoint site with their production credentials. And it just makes it so much easier to, to organize and navigate and move around. You can get a link, click on it, open it in your default browser, and it doesn't uh, doesn't blow up on you, doesn't sign you out of your other sessions through there. Because you can't have one browser signed into multiple Microsoft 365 tenants at the same time. You have to pick and choose, which is where browser profiles come in handy. But this makes that even better from that point of view. I mean, we have one major client we've just finished a, a year-long multi-thousand hour project on, and, and we use this extensively in their environment. There was uh, about 10 staff on our side involved in the project, but there was about 40 or 50 staff on on the client side, um, and they actually had about 300 staff that, that needed to come into user acceptance testing areas and training areas and such and, and provide access in there. We actually leveraged the groups that they had in their on-premise Active Directory and, and used those scripts to sync into the non-prod environment. So if a, a user needed to come into the training area, you know, and they were a general business user, they already belonged to an Active Directory group that gave them access to the production site that we were replacing. So we could just sync that group across here, give it the appropriate access to the, the non-prod, say the training, training environment, and, and boom, they were in. We didn't have to communicate out credentials to hundreds of users and, and manage all that. It actually went through the standard onboarding processes and standard on-premise Active Directory groups that were already in place. So you can start to build a pretty sophisticated model to, to manage that access. And, and under the hood, basically, we've got a, just a couple of SharePoint lists that act as data sources for that PowerShell script. It defines you know, what are each of the non-prod Azure AD tenants that we've got that we need to synchronize into. And, and what are those the subscriptions within those tenants? Because you can have multiple Azure subscriptions within one Azure AD. And basically the script goes through, says, hey, I've got a list of, of groups that I need to sync up. Um, I will go through each of these tenants and make sure that we've got those groups appropriately created and all the guests 
um, set up as B2B guests over here and that these guests are all in the right groups within here. And, and you can run that multiple times. So as your, you know, your membership changes over here in your production environment, just rerun the script and it gets everything up to date for you. So it's a really nice way to, to provide easy management around that and not have a whole whack of different credentials flying around. I mean, we use one password from a password fault point of view that helps with that, uh, but this is still a, a better approach from that perspective. Okay, so that's that's sort of the background from a, a software development lifecycle and the idea of having you know completely isolated tenants and and such. Now, how do we actually move applications between those different tenants? And I'm going to start with our, our live www.externetusermanager.com site. So this is the site you came to, to to register for the webinar, and there's a bunch of code and, and elements behind there. So let's actually look at you know some of the, the things that are driving how that site actually works. We actually have two versions of the site. There's the public website that you go to, but there's also a, a CMS version of the website that we use for content authoring. Um, and basically we've got a, an API that publishes content from SharePoint Online to those two sites. And there's a whole process around that. There's logic apps for you know, submitting those changes and approving them and, and managing that whole process from a content creation point of view. But you as a site visitor, I mean, you probably responded to a, a MailChimp um, email that we sent out to you. So you would have got a marketing email with a link to our public website. You would have come to the form. You click on the link to register. Um, we actually put some smarts in that. So it provides contact information as part of that link and we can pre-populate that form. You submit the form and it's actually submitting to uh, an Azure Logic App. That Logic App um, checks to see if you're in our Dynamics 365. Um, if not, it adds you as a new lead in there and updates the mailing list and such from there. And it also sends out a calendar inv invitation. So that's the, the invite that you got from Logan. He doesn't actually bang out all those calendar invites. It's, it's actually driven through this Logic Ops workflow process and ultimately use that link to, uh, to then connect in and, and join into the site. So how do we get all of this infrastructure uh, deployed out and, and running? Well, this is what our um, non-prod and, and prod environments look like. Now, we don't have a, a middle QA environment. We do our QA in, in dev. We're a fairly small team, 18 staff in total. Uh, but this works well for us. So as I mentioned, you know, this is kind of your minimum that you want to have in place. Now, we do have sort of a, a, a somewhat separate QA slot in here. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. If we start on the non-prod side over here, uh, basically we've got instances of, of you know, the published site as well as the CMS sites. So we can test not just how the site's functioning, but changes we're doing on the publishing process with our publisher product, all is a self-contained piece of that. There's logic apps for doing things like the registrations that I was describing, um, and there's Dynamics 365. Now Dynamics and the whole Power Platform, um, if you work with Power Automate or Power Apps, um, is a little bit different in terms of how they manage non-prod environments. So within one Azure AD tenant, you can actually create multiple environments and, and it's actually easier to keep it in the same tenant and, and use Microsoft's vision around the environments for this part here. Um, simply because what you can do is you can go into Dynamics 365 and say, I want to snapshot my whole production CRM and create a, a sandbox version of it in another environment that's, that's completely independent and separate and we can use that as our development or our testing. You might want to run some scripts to do some cleansing. You may not want to have people's real email addresses so that as you're you know, testing things like emails getting sent out, they don't accidentally get sent to real contacts as part of that. Uh, but that's the exception. I would see this living in our production Azure AD and, and being a separate, they call them environment within Dynamics 365. It's a little bit trickier because if you need to actually manage Dynamics, you need to be an administrator, um, in both the dev and the, the production. So there's you know rights and permissions to think about from that point of view. But in any case, we've got this self-contained non-production environment. And then in production, uh, we have what are called two slots. We have a live slot and a staging slot. And, and basically these are two copies of the Azure App services that are running the websites. So there's the one that you hit as a, as a live site visitor. There's the one our content authors use as a live one. And then we've got the staging versions of those, which are kind of ready and waiting uh, to be deployed out. And, and the way that works, if we go into the Azure portal, and I'll show you this live in a minute. Um, basically, we've got these two slots defined for our app service. And an app service is basically a, a way to run a, um, a web server in the cloud and have Microsoft manage the whole thing for you. So it's called Platform as a Service. They take care of patching and scaling. It's, it's very scalable, very cost effective from that point of view. Basically right now we've got 100% of our traffic going to the production slot 
um, and the pipelines are going to show you in a minute to do the deployment actually deploy into this staging slot and and what happens is when we're happy we can actually live preview what's happening in this slot it is a full working version of the site and when we're comfortable we've done the you know the final acceptance testing we want to swap that we hit the swap button up here and that becomes the live site and not only does it immediately come in because it's all warmed up and ready to go uh, but if something goes horribly wrong with that and we want to roll back we just swap again and we're we're back to our pre-release version of that so it's really nice from a, a quick go live point of view it can be warmed up ready to run and, and just start receiving requests right away with no delays for users and if anything goes badly with that you can swap it back to the, your your previous version very quickly from that you can have more than two slots you can define lots of slots through here um, we find it best to have separate environments for you know dev and test and, and production and just use the slots for that go live piece through there so let me actually show you in the uh, azure portal what that looks like so here I'm, I'm in the Microsoft Azure portal and I've gone to the main app server. This is actually our live production website. I can see, you know, CPU load and requests and things that are happening on the production website through here. You know, it's got a plan associated with it. We've got two nodes in there, so it's highly available and Microsoft takes care of load balancing and, and scaling that and, and making sure that all works. So I can click the link here and, and jump out to the, the live site easily from there. This is what you would see if you visit that URL. Now, if I come over here to my deployment slots, we can see there's my live production one and here's my staging slot and, and I can click into that and it's a fully configurable app service on its own. I can set its own configuration with different parameters in there. I can set its own custom domains. I can load up SSL certs for it. We didn't bother doing that. We left it with an Azure websites.net URL on there because nobody's supposed to visit this site. It's just there for us to check it out. But if you were to hit that site live yourself right now, you'd actually get the site coming up. And it would be the the, the version before the current released version. It's, it's basically what got swapped out when we made the new version live is what's sitting in that slot, unless we run a pipeline. So let's actually take you through what that process looks like. So, so what does continuous integration look like in this project? Well, the developer works locally in, in Visual Studio and they test in IS Express. So they just load up the solution in Visual Studio, they do their coding, you know, whatever back end, front end development they want to do, they press F5, they run it, and it launches a browser and, and a local IS Express, and it just runs locally on their, their workstation, their laptop, however they're working. In fact, we've rolled service laptops out for all staff. Um, that's what they're doing the development on as, as part of this. Now, as a developer is working, sometimes you don't want to go through a whole published process. So maybe you're tweaking some JavaScript or some CSS and you want to actually push it up to the dev integration site and just have a look and, and see what that looks like there rather than in your, your local instance. You can actually do that right within Visual Studio. Uh, but ultimately, you know, you're going to finish your work. You're going to check those changes back into source control and you're going to run the, the build pipeline. Now, we don't have steps in here, but we could define steps as part of that process just to say hey when when somebody does a pull request and, and wants to put that code back in there can be mandatory code reviews that need to happen on it mandatory unit testing that needs to successfully run before it can actually get checked back into source control depends how you know how formal you want to be in your your software development processes but the the tooling and we're using azure devops for this supports all of those sorts of models and then either manually you run the build pipeline or you can have it auto run to say, hey, when somebody checks changes in, just go ahead and run the, the build pipeline. Basically what it does, it gets all the components out of source control, it builds it and it deploys it out to, uh, to the various different app services. So those two dev app services, as well as those staging uh, production app service. It doesn't deploy it to the live sites. We don't want to do that. We only want to do that as part of our, our swap when we're ready. So now anybody can hit that dev integration site, do whatever sort of functional user acceptance testing they want to do as part of that. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, final user acceptance testing can happen in that prod staging environment. When, when everybody's happy with that decision is made to, to go live, okay, we can do the swap on it, that releases it out and you can swap back if there's any issues with that. So what does this look like in, in Azure DevOps? And again, I'm going to take you into the live pages in a minute, but this is the pipeline that, that builds that process. Actually, let me take you there right now. So if we come in here to our Azure DevOps, so I'm in our website project. Now, DevOps is not just something that you build these pipelines for doing deployments. It's something you basically run your whole project in. So if I have a look here, 
say on my uh, sprint backlogs from a board's point of view, this is coming back to the agile methodology point of view. You know, we, we had a sprint going, actually it's a little loose with, with this project. It was set to finish April 30th, but some stuff is carried through. Um, basically what this is showing is, is the task board view of the work for this sprint. So there's some things that we're doing. You know, these blue on the left here are, are called user stories. So these are basically you know, functional requirements or uh, scenarios of what we want to have happen. You want to do some formatting changes on the disclaimer page. You want to update a password policy. You want to implement some new B2B features, change the NAB structure on it. And then these here on the right are the tasks associated with that. So sprint planning happens against the stories and then technical decomposition says take those stories and build the actual technical tasks that are going to be assigned to people that they work on from there. And you can see some of these are uh, in the new state. They haven't started yet. Some of them are in the resolve state, which means they're, they're finished development. They have deployed to dev integration. But QA doesn't, hasn't had a pass through yet to, to QA those and say, oh, those actually closed and, and ready to deploy from that point of view. So we manage the project through here. All of our source control is in here as well. So as we check in, check out, it's all going against DevOps through here. And then if we come down into your pipelines, this is the part that we want to focus on here. Here's our main pipeline that does the build and, and deploy. So I can click on that. I can hit edit on here and say, hey, I want to look at the actual steps involved in that pipeline. So you know, it, it gets some, some base stuff that it needs to run around NuGet. Um, it basically restores the, the solution into the local working area. Now, this is not building on my machine. It's building up in the cloud. So you get a certain number of build hours with your subscription, and then you can pay for extra hours from there. But the beauty is you don't have to uh, maintain build servers or, or provide any infrastructure for this. Microsoft takes care of all that for you. It then builds the, the Visual Studio solution, uh, publishes up some debugging symbols, and then actually starts the deployment. So there's there's pairs of steps we see here. So this is deploying to the dev CMS site. So it's it's deploying that out to that app service. And then it's restarting that app service to make sure everything's ready to go and, and the new code is running there. And then it does the same thing to the main published dev site. And then these are the actual slots. So this is going to the staging slot of the live site. So we can actually see down here that it's going to our production websites resource group on our main subscription, but it's going into the staging slot, not into the uh, the production slot. And then it restarts that and it does the same thing for the CMS version of that. So now everything's ready to go. Uh, the one thing we didn't put in the pipelines is warm-ups. Um, we should probably put some uh, um, alert monitors that, that check the sites and warm them up so that you don't have to wait for sort of that first user experience when that comes through from there. But basically all of these four sites are now ready to go with the latest code that's checked in and it's been done in a consistent way so we don't have to worry about hey did somebody follow you know this set of steps this time and maybe miss one of those steps later all that um, error and chance goes away as, as part of this process so if i go back a step here and actually look at one of these runs um, you can actually see this live as the pipeline's running. I'm not going to start a pipeline. It takes, like you see here, about seven minutes to run through that. But you can actually go back and, and see all of the, uh, the code that's running and the thing that it's doing. You know, okay, I'm building the solution. So it's actually running the Visual Studio build process on that build agent and, and building that package up and publishing those artifacts and then deploying that out to the app service, restarting that app service, and you can see the same sequence continuing through there. And, and as it's running, you'll actually see live updates coming through the process here, so you can follow it along and, and watch it as it goes through there. So that's really the process around the, the Extranet User Manager website. And I used it as, as an example of sort of a more traditional website project. It's built in Visual Studio. We've got C-sharp code. It has to go through a build process. We also do minifying of, of JavaScript and CSS so that it performs well from a page load point of view. You know, all that happens as part of this pipeline process here. So let's switch gears now though and, and talk about Teams provisioning. And if you're not familiar with our, our Teams provisioning solution, it's an open source. We, we published it up on GitHub. We're just getting uh, a new version ready to publish out from there. And it's really around providing a, a self-service um, framework for requesting teams and team sites and all the, the supporting um, components as part of that. So there's a number of pieces that get deployed as part of this solution. There's a, there's a couple of SharePoint framework web parts. So we've got the actual 
team request form here. I mean, it's a very dynamic web part. You can customize the fields that show up in here without cracking the code open just by doing changes to content types in SharePoint. So we want to get that SharePoint framework web part deployed into your tenant. Um, and then we've got the A to Z web parts that can be filtered down to, to particular areas like this one's just showing me what's in the demo temporary demos area. Um, you know, this becomes a quick navigation link for people to be able to jump into the SharePoint team sites, into the team itself, into other resources from there. So that's part of it. We need to get those web parts built and deployed. Um, and then if we keep going, we've also got a num number of other components as part of this. And, and I skipped it on the website, but we do use Azure, Azure Logic apps as part of the website. We don't have that built into that deployment process yet. We're actually finishing this one off first, and we're going to use this as a model going forward. Sorry. Felt a sneeze coming, but it didn't actually arrive, so I'm okay. Um, so if you're familiar with Power Automate and you're not familiar with Logic Apps, they're, they're actually the same platform. It's it's what powers Power Automate. There are some differences. You know, the Logic Apps has a very simple approval process in it. Power Automate has actually a really rich one I'm, I'm quite a fan of. And, and often we, we, we do hybrid where part of the work is in Logic Apps and part of the work is in Power Automate, just so we can avoid some of the, the licensing implications, use the you know the deep integration power of logic apps but then benefit the uh, the approvals richness on the power automate side um, it is very integrated in with visual studio um, this is the pricing model it's kind of hard to read here i put commas in which is a little weird after the decimal but it's basically showing you that you know each action that executes in your logic app you pay 32 millionths of a dollar for that action so you got to add up a, a big number of actions to get any sort of significant dollars typically we're you know, a couple dollars a month is is sort of a typical spend from a Logic Apps point of view. Um, that's a little different than, than Power Automate's per user licensing, which is where it becomes attractive. Um, the other part of the solution is Azure Automation. Um, this is a way to run PowerShell scripts up in the cloud. And, and the idea here is, you know, much like the build processes for pipelines that I was talking about, Microsoft manages those virtual machines. You never actually see the VMs. Um, Azure takes care of all that for you. It just grabs one from a pool, runs your script, um, and, and then sort of puts it back in the pool when you're done from there. It's very cost effective. You get 500 min minutes free runtime per month with your subscription. And it's 0.2 uh, cents per minute after that. So again, very cost effective. You don't tend to run up a lot of charges on this. So if we look at the actual Teams provisioning solution, a little small, apologies on that. Um, but basically we've got the, the SharePoint framework web part here where you submit your request. Um, there's a sites list in SharePoint that kind of manages the whole process, but we didn't connect the web part straight to SharePoint. We put a, a Logic App workflow in between um, and it's got some Azure AD authentication that I talked about in my previous webinar uh, with some bearer token validation that happens as part of that so that we know that this piece is secure and the person that's filling out this form doesn't need rights or even visibility into the sites list. We want to keep this as a protected list through here. Now, once everything's submitted, um, then it does the, the provision. And this is the spot here where we can optionally hook out into Power Automate to say, hey, we want to do a, an approval over in Power Automate and then pick up the completion of that and, and come back into the actual provisioning process here. The provisioning uses Azure Automation to run some PowerShells. There's sort of a, a main PowerShell, there's a helper, and there's a spot for you to keep all of your customization so they don't get blurred in with the, the main open source project. And ultimately that's gonna provision out the team, the, the SharePoint team site, the OneNote, the group in Azure AD, you know, all the different elements that come out as part of that. So a lot of moving pieces here. Uh, they basically all live in a, a resource group in Teams. So here, let me flip over to the live view here. So I'm in that resource group in our development tenant. And you can see up at the top here, I'm, I'm using my uh, my production credentials, my P. Carson credentials, but I'm going against that Envision IT dev tenant. So this is an example where I'm signed in with my prod tenant. You know, I can do things in my regular tenant through here, but I can also access Azure and SharePoint in those non-prod environments seamlessly. So we see here we've got all our various different components. We've got um, a, a number of API connections that are used by the Logic App. We've got our automation account. We've got the actual Logic App workflows themselves. So, you know, the one that gets called when you submit the form and then it calls validate bear token to make sure it's good. You know, maybe it needs to complete the submission after a Power Automate approval and then provision the site out, provision the site actually calls out to this runbook to say, hey, go do the heavy lifting in PowerShell. 
you know, apply any customizations and, and do all your work from that point of view. So what we want to do is, is deploy this whole thing out um, as updates happen into those dev test and production tenants. So how do we do that? Uh, well, there's a, a technique from Microsoft called ARM templates. ARM stands for Azure Resource Manager, and ARM templates are a way to deploy uh, resources into Azure with a standardized template. And it could be things like virtual machines that you're deploying, could be an app service like the external user manager website, could be databases, uh, could be the logic apps, the, the automation accounts, you know, basically packaging up what lives in a resource group in Azure um, into a template that you can deploy. You know, you can use the, the standard Azure portal to say, hey, I just want to, you know, build my own template, load it up from, from my disk and, and deploy it. You can run PowerShell to do that, um, or you can actually use pipelines, which we're going to talk about at, at the end of this to, to run this process. Now, the challenge is that a lot of the ARM template work historically has, has been done around infrastructure as a service, like I need to deploy it a bunch of virtual machines and networks and things like that. Not so much has been spent on things like logic apps and Azure automation. So when we get into, you know, how do we build an ARM template, which is basically a big JSON file, for, for this scenario, what we need to do is, is think about things like parameters and variables on the logic apps and the automation account. So let me come back to the browser for a second here, and I want to take you into some important points in here. So if I look at this create site submit form logic app, this is the one that gets called when somebody says, I'd like a new team, and they press the button on the SharePoint framework web part. Um, so every time somebody presses the button, it, it does a run through here and you know maybe there's approval required maybe there isn't and then it goes through and does the provisioning process so i can actually edit that workflow it takes me into the designer you know, i've got a, a pretty sort of WYSIWYG viewer where i can basically connect up the the boxes and and each of these are actions so each of these steps are those 32 millions of a dollar as they run from there with some caveats if if there's something that's a premium connector, maybe you're calling it to Salesforce or something like that. Uh, there is a higher charge for that, but it's it's not many orders of magnitude different. But the important point I want to stress here is this parameters button here. And you may not notice it when you first start working with logic apps, but it's a really important construct. And the idea is, is take any of the, the things in your logic app that are environment dependent, like what's the email address of, of the operator that I want to send emails to, to to let them know there's errors and things like that. You know, this is sending to to my Envision IT dev tenant through here for testing purposes. I'd want that to be a different email in my production environment. And I don't want to have to go searching through all the steps, finding that and changing that. That's an onerous process to do that. So I can add new parameters through here. I can define the type of the parameter and what its value is. And then when I'm in the actual script, you know, it basically references those, or sorry, not the script, but the, the logic app workflow, it references those values. Like here, we want to create that item in the sites list. Oops, I haven't actually updated this one. I should actually put the, uh, the parameter value in for that. So I'm still work in progress, sorry. Basically, it, it starts showing up as these values through here. And, and what you want to do is go through all of your logic apps and parameterize all of them. Now, they may not all have the same need for parameters in them, like the validate bearer token is, is not actually doing a lot of work. It's, it's basically doing string processing and validation of the bearer token, so it doesn't need to have connections to SharePoint and things like that, whereas the submit form does. So figure out which parameters you need in which, and which are common, and ideally name them the same so there's consistency across that to say, hey, if I've got a, you know, a site's URL that I use in submit form and I've got a parameter for that, let's make sure I, I define the same parameter name in, in this logic app, because they are independent. They're not connected to each other. You could put arbitrary names to, to the parameters that don't match, even though they are the same thing. It just causes confusion in your project. So that's on the, the logic app side. The same sort of thing applies on the Azure automation. So this is where the PowerShell runs. So we've got a, a number of run books that can get executed underneath this Azure automation account. These are a little different than the logic apps because we don't define parameters on each run book like we do with each logic app. We actually define what are called variables in the automation account. But same sort of thing. You know, If we've got a, a root URL of the tenant uh, that we want to use in the PowerShell script, put it in a variable here, and then when we deploy to different environments, we can update these parameters to match that environment. And it just abstracts it and makes it much simpler. Now, the challenge is that uh, when you 
generate an RM template, it has no concept of these parameters that you define in your logic app or these automation account variables that you define um, in your automation accounts. So, so how do you wire that together? And, and there's a couple ways that we can do that. You know, we can just simply go through exporting from the Azure portal. So if I come back to the portal here for a sec and I go up to the resource group level, I can come down here and say I want to export the template. And, and what an ARM template is, just a big block of JSON. It can be a little overwhelming to look at because uh, there's a lot there. We'll give it a second to generate that. Um, and basically what you would need to do is, is go in and define additional parameters for the parameters that you had in your run books and in your uh, your logic apps and, and wire those together through the JSON itself. Actually, that looks like it's going to take a while. I'm going to flip over in a minute to the, the Visual Studio version of that. So I could do that. I could export the resources at the resource group level. I'll get a single template with all that. I won't have any parameters defined for that. So I either need to, to manually edit that JSON file and, and add all those parameters in, or I just go ahead and deploy it knowing that it's pointing to the wrong things and go into every um, logic app and, and every automation account and fix those up. Either way, it's time consuming and error prone. And I have to do it every time I, I package for deployment. So every change I do, I've got to go through and, and repeat that process, which is likely going to get broken somewhere in there. So it's really not a good approach to take. So what we did, it, it sounded like a straightforward task. It actually turned into a, a bit of a black hole. We worked on this for the better part of the last four months and, and engaged some external MVPs to help out as well. Say, hey, you know, can we build a script that targets a resource group and, and basically does the same thing. It exports all the resources into one template, um, but also exports individual templates. So we can do source control around that and has a parameter file that, that defines those parameters we want to get created on the ARM template and does the mapping for us into the logic app and the automation. So it becomes a very repeatable process. So let me show you what that looks like on the, uh, the team's provisioning side of things. So I'm in our uh, Teams source control here, so we've got a couple of scripts. There's a, a generator and a deployer, and and I won't go through all the script detail. There's a there's a lot of script here, but basically, this dumps out the um, the ARM template from the resource group, but then it does a bunch of fix up to connect up the the parameters. And basically, we've got our own JSON file that defines parameters that we either use in the logic apps or in the um, the Azure Automation, what their default values are, and, and the script basically uses this to go fix up the ARM template and, and connect up to, to all those parameters in the Logic App and the, um, the Azure Automation. So at the end of the day, um, you, you've got a, an exported ARM template that comes out from that, and you've got a repeatable process as part of it. So if I come into this folder here, um, this template.json, I'm actually going to show you what an ARM template looks like. Um, as I mentioned, it's it's a little overwhelming because there's a lot of stuff in here, but you know somewhere down in here we'll actually start to see the the steps and in individual logic app workflows. I mean that's all embedded in the uh, in the ARM template. But in addition to, to dumping out the full template that you can use for deployment, it actually dumps out individual templates as well. So if we think about that submit form logic app that I was talking about before, you know I can actually do a, a, a view history on that and see the different versions, say, okay, I want to compare, you know, these two versions and see what got changed in them. And, and look, the only change that I'm seeing is that we changed the default value for one of those list goods. Uh, but if I change some of the logic, I would actually see those changes through there. It becomes really valuable from a, a change tracking point of view and understanding the history of what's happened with. I mean, the, the Azure portal will give you the, um, the history. So if you do come in here and you say, hey, I, I want to look at that submit form logic app. I'm trying to remember where I see that. Oh, there we go, the versions. So this shows me every version, but they're only the versions for this tenant. So if I had you know, different tenants and different versions, this starts to become unmanageable. This is handy if you, you know, don't check something properly into source control and, and you overwrite some changes and you need to go back. You can do this to roll back from that point of view, but I wouldn't consider it a, a smart way to manage from a, a source control point of view. You want to have those checked into a proper um, Azure DevOps or, or Git repository from a source control perspective. <clears throat> 
So when it comes time to deploying that, I mean, we, we could deploy that generated template just through the portal like I was showing in those original screenshots. Um, you know, I'd, I'd have to, to fix up the, the parameters in there. I would need to, to create what's called a run as account for the automation account, set its permission, and I also need to deploy the runbook scripts because those actually don't deploy as part of the ARM template. ARM templates don't support that. So we need a way to get the scripts into those runbooks. So we created a second script here, ARM template deployer, which basically deploys that template on all its parameters um, and, and everything's wired up and connected already just as part of the ARM template deployment. But it goes further, it then says, okay, let's create the run as account, uh, which we use from a security point of view. I talked about that a fair bit in, in the previous webinar. You know, so we need to create a, a self-signed certificate, register the service principal in Azure AD, provision that account, set up the API permissions on that. So there's a bunch of steps that need to happen here to make sure your Azure automation is set up appropriately. It also needs to deploy the runbook scripts. At the end of all that, you, you will need an administrator to still go into the Azure portal and, and open up the service principal and grant consent for those API permissions. We can't do that through a script. It has to be a, a global admin that does that through the portal from a security point of view. But that's really the only manual step left that needs to happen as part of that. And that's only if the, the API permissions change. So what does this look like from a continuous integration point of view? Um, what happens is you know, the developer works in the Azure portal. So, so they're busy working in here in, in the edit panel, you know, typically in the designer vote mode, but you can switch into code view if you need to as part of that as well. You know, they can run run tests and try things out and, and do all that work. It's actually happening live in the, the dev integration tenant as part of that. Um, if they're doing PowerShell scripts for those run books, we typically architect our scripts so that you can run them locally in your, your PowerShell ISEs. You can set breakpoints and step through and do that kind of things. Uh, when, when you're happy with that, I mean, you can paste those up into uh, the Azure portal run books for testing purposes there. But you know, from a final test point of view, you, you check those local scripts into source control. You run that ARM template generator, which creates those combined and individual templates and all of those changes get tracked into source control. So we've got proper tracking of each of those logic app um, templates as part of that. We basically run the, the pipeline similar to what I was showing you for the UM website. So it's going to create the package and then it's going to deploy that ARM template. So it's, it's going to use that ARM template deployer PowerShell and deploy that out into dev integration. Um, and then when you're happy with that, you want to move that into QA or into production, you run the release pipeline and it basically re repeats that last step to say, hey, take that package that was created in the build package, use ARM template deployer and deploy that out to the appropriate environment. So it makes it much easier to move things like your logic app workflows or your Azure automation runbooks from environment to environment. You're not doing it manually. As you can see, there's lots of moving pieces. It'd be pretty error prone to do it that way. Okay. Um, Last scenario here before uh, before we wrap up and switch gears a little bit is Power BI side. Now this is actually more of a work in progress. So if you're not familiar with Power BI, um, it's an awesome reporting and dashboarding tool. We use it a lot in, in running our business from a, an operations point of view, from a client point of view. Uh, we do inventories of file shares and, uh, and SharePoint on-premise to prepare for migration projects and build a, a cool dashboard in Power BI as part of that. But the same challenge applies. How do we how do we manage multiple different environments? How do we move a Power BI from environment to environment? So we can obviously do it manually. I can open Power BI desktop and and I can just say publish to to whatever environment. Now I need to sign my Power BI desktop into the environment that I'm going to be publishing to. So I can't use the the idea of guest accounts and and permissions from that point of view. So if I come over to my Power BI for a second here. So this is Power BI Desktop where you build the, the reports and the underlying data models behind them and, and you sign into Power BI here. So I'm signing to our production tenant. So if I was to come here and say I want to do a publish, it would be publishing to the workspaces in our prod tenant. If I wanted to publish to a, a non-prod tenant, first I'd need to sign Power BI Desktop into that tenant and then do the file published into that area. Now, before we do that, there's a really important point to make. Just like parameters in logic apps and, and run books, there's parameters in Power BI, and they're really important to leverage. So, so I've defined a number of parameters in this Power BI model. And, you know, what's the URL of our dynamic CRM that it's going to be connecting to to get its data? And there's also an Azure SQL database that it needs to grab some data from as well. We want to parameterize those so that those, as we move into different environments, we can switch those parameters uh, to, to different values from there. Now to do that, 
what I need to do is, is come on into the transform data here, which takes me into the back end Power Query Edit where I actually work on my queries. And if I come in here, I can edit my parameters and I can define, actually no, I don't want to do the edit, I want to do the manage. There we go. This allows me to actually define new parameters and set up the types from them. When you create a, a new parameter, just bear in mind it defaults to this any type. If you don't change that to a, a explicit type, you won't be able to set this parameter when you publish this to Power BI online. So it's important to make sure you set the right values in there. And, and also to make sure that anything that's environment specific, you've got to find through those parameters. So when I publish this report out, I can then go into the Power BI service and, and actually change those parameters and point it at a new data source from there. Because when I manually publish, um, you know, a PBIX file, which is the, the Power BI desktop file format, is, is the model and the reports, but also the data itself. So when, when I'm looking at this dashboard here, you know, when I do a refresh, it's actually refreshing live into the data model in Power BI desktop. And when I save that, it actually saves that data with it. So when I deploy it, um, it's going to deploy with whatever data is stored in there. If I then go in and change those parameters to reflect the right environment, I'm going to need to re-enter credentials so that it can authenticate to those new data sources, and I've got to do a refresh from there so that I see the, the correct data for that environment, not what was in the Power BI desktop file. Now, you can also save files as PBITs. They're called template files for Power BI. Um, they have the report and the data model in them, but they don't have any of the data. So if you've got a you know, a, a gigabyte data set that's huge and you don't want to be checking that one gig file in every time you change it into your source control, which is probably not a good idea. Um, save it as a PBIT and it'll strip all the data out and be a much smaller file from that point of view. Um, unfortunately, you can't directly import those PBITs into Power BI on, online. You have to load it into Power BI desktop, enter the parameters for the environments you want, and then publish that to the environment. But it's a, another option to consider from that point of view. But how would we automate this whole process? Um, well, let's say we've we've got the PBIX or the PBIT checked into source control. So we've got it in Git or in, in DevOps. Um, and basically we want to create a pipeline. And we've we've taken a first stab at this, but like I mentioned, there's still some, some blockers that we have. So we can create the package from source control. Um, there's, there's APIs available um, to the pipelines to be able to deploy that to the Power BI service. And, and we can use service principles to authenticate to the Power BI service to do the deployment. So we're safe from that point of view in terms of how we're managing security. The, the pipeline can update the parameters to point it to the right deployment. But this is the problem here is, is that, yes, it can update the credentials, but it needs stored versions of those credentials to enter into the Power BI online service. And that just doesn't sit well with me. Um, two reasons. One is, you know, you really don't want to have those credentials hanging around. Yes, we can put them into Key Vault and we can get fancy so that Azure Key Vault is a secure storage for credentials and the pipeline can can retrieve from Key Vault and then push them into Power BI service. So that's better, but it would still require that account to have multi-factor authentication turned off on it. Uh, because this is a, a back-end process, it can't respond to a, an authenticator app on a mobile phone to, to confirm credentials as part of this, so it's going to blow up as soon as MFA gets triggered on this. I'm a really strong proponent of never, ever, ever turning MFA off in your, uh, for sure, in your production environment for any account. Don't create a user account that's sort of a, a, a fake service user account for this to be used and say, hey, we'll put a conditional access policy on that to turn MFA off on that one user. Bad idea. You just open up a security hole into your environment as part of that. So I actually have a call coming up later this week with uh, with two other uh, Power BI Microsoft MVPs, one out in the West Coast, one locally here to, to dig into this one. I, I'd really like to figure out what's a, a workable solution around this. Um, but ultimately, you, know, you need those credentials updated. You need to refresh that data. Maybe it means that we need to do some automation of Power BI Desktop because we've got more control there. And Power BI Desktop will actually cache the credentials securely, so you won't have to go through that MFA challenge. I'm not sure. Stay tuned, and, and I'll let you know what happens with that. But basically, we did build a, a YAML pipeline uh, that will do that deployment into the different environments, and it will update the the, the report and data set, it'll set the parameters, it'll set the credentials, it'll do the refresh, all the things that need to happen from there. It's just that challenge around the credentials that's still bugging me.
Um, now this is built with what's called a, a YAML pipeline. So the, the first one I showed you for the EUM website was uh, sort of a, an older style Azure DevOps pipeline where it's kind of a wizard based structure. YAML pipelines are, are code based pipelines and you don't have to write all of this code yourself. There's, there's snippets and helpers that kind of let you build the steps out from there, but it becomes very flexible to, to basically code up your pipeline from there. You know, this pipeline runs, it, it downloads the PBIX, it deploys it out to the target environment, and then having that report running out in your uh, your Power BI service from there. Now I'm getting a little tight on time, but I uh, actually didn't have a demo live for this one anyway, so that's okay. Uh, the last point I wanted to make around that whole um, continuous deployment, continuous integration is it's really important to be t doing testing as part of that. And ideally, you want to do automated testing as part of that. Um, that becomes a challenge. How do you do browser based testing? There's lots of different tools you can use for that. Uh, the one that we're focusing on right now is Selenium. And Selenium is an open source project. Um, basically provides standard APIs for doing automation against all the major browsers. So you don't have to write code specifically to Chrome versus Firefox versus Safari. You know, if, if you want to have an action that opens a browser window and, and goes to a particular URL, you, you write that once and Selenium figures out how to do that with all the different browsers from there. So you can build very robust uh, browser based regression tests as part of that. You can scale that across multiple different environments. So you can run the, the same tests that are parameterized against your dev, your QA, your UAT, even your production if you want to use this as part of your gate before you do that swap to live to say, hey, we want to run the automated test on that and make sure everything's good. Um, it allows you to do that. So I've just got a couple of screenshots here that kind of illustrate. Uh, so you build the, the Selenium project in Visual Studio. There's add-ins to Visual Studio. You, you snap in to provide that. Now, a little small to see here, but this is the actual script that's doing the automation. You know, it's opening a browser window. Here we're doing some browser-based testing of our Extranet User Manager product. So it's, it's launching into the admin console. It's adding a group. It's setting some properties on there. It's checking to see that the right things happen as part of that. So this becomes a really important smoke test to be able to run your app through as part of that. Now you can actually use a recorder, so you can you know, basically have a live browser session and, and click through the steps and it will create the code based on the steps that you followed through from there. You typically have to tweak that a little bit to, to get it the right way that you want from a, uh, a test point of view. It allows you to build a really rich test from that. And because this is code, I mean, you can pull in uh, parameters that define, hey, what accounts or value should I be using in the different environments? It could even reach out into databases to say, you know, here's a list of, of user credentials to use in this test environment versus this dev environment and, and run the test appropriately from there. So you can get quite sophisticated in terms of how you build those out. There's a lot of commercial tools beyond Selenium that, that do similar kinds of things. There's often some pretty significant costs associated with that into the order of you know, tens of thousands of dollars a year from a subscription fee point of view, but there can be big savings from a, a development of the, the task point of view as well. So you got to kind of look at your complexity of your project and say what, what makes sense for our organization. But if you embark on this, I mean, the, the pipelines and the, the continuous uh, integration side of it, just from a deployment pipeline point of view, huge win from that perspective. And, and then the automated testing is just another layer to, to add on on top of that. Okay, so just wrapping up, that was my last scenario that I wanted to go through. I just want to do a quick plug here. Uh, two more webinars on the queue. We've got a, a bunch more in works here through the uh, the summer and early fall that we're going to be announcing as well but we're going to be doing a, a planner boards power bi one so so taking microsoft planner where you can create uh, different plans with different tasks for different people and, and organize those how do you roll that up and have sort of portfolio management and, and using power bi to do that there's not direct connections between power bi and planner unfortunately microsoft doesn't have that plumbing in place yet but we've built some some ip around that that i'll be sharing the powershell scripts and, and how we architect that and then the second webinar, Managing Complex Projects, is a, actually a joint webinar with one of our par partners, kind of a use case scenario going through a, an, an actual implementation from a project management point of view and, and how do you leverage teams and um, external access and, and all that as part of that. So if that, um, I've got two minutes left here. Logan, I don't know if we've got any questions from the group that we want to address as, as part of the live talk. Yeah, there are some great questions actually. Um, so I published them out there, Peter. So the first one is, is the PowerShell script to sync prod groups in SharePoint to non-prod groups um, as guests? Is that available? 
that are you sharing that out? It's it's not yet, but it's something that I'm thinking that we should share as uh, an article with some downloaded PowerShell content. So if there's interest in there and it sounds like there is, then yeah, I'd definitely be interested in sharing that out. Um, second question, how, how do you handle scenarios where you're custom developing features into user profile information. You're not licensing users on three separate tenants. So I guess the scenario is, hey, I'm extending Azure Active Directory. How do I do that in uh, in my non-prod where I don't have users for, you know, local users as guest users that are coming in to build that? I mean, we do use a combination of, of licensed users and guest users through there. You know, we'll, we'll sometimes spin up uh, more than one or two um, member users where we have to get into that side of scenario. Some of the Azure AD extensions to, from a schema point of view, you can do on the guest accounts as well. So you know, it depends exactly what you're doing as to how you want to balance that out and, and how, how do you want to minimize the licensing from that perspective. Um, CI CD solution out of the box for deploying database changes. Yeah, I didn't really talk about SQL as part of this. I was more focused on the sort of the 365 components. Um, I haven't dove into that myself, but yeah, you could definitely create a pipeline to say, hey, here's our, our database change script. I mean, we have that as part of our extra user manager product as we release new versions. We have a script that, that runs to update the schema and, and do any data manipulation that has to happen as part of that promotion. You could build those scripts into a pipeline as, as part of your process as well. I, I'm not familiar though with what's out of the box from that point of view. Um, Looks like you took a lot of time to solve the ARM template solution, uh, the the generator, et cetera, are those um, available. So same kind of comment as the, the multiple environments. Yeah, we have been thinking about sharing those out. There's still a bit of work in process. We're, we're tweaking a few things on there. Actually, Jack Lee's a, a fellow Microsoft MVP that helped a lot on those. He's actually going to be doing a, a talk later this month on BICEP, which is kind of the evolution of ARM templates beyond what I showed you here. It's a new design pattern coming from Microsoft. Um, and we've talked about maybe releasing some of this stuff out and, and how that fits into that as well. So yeah, I am interested in that. We're just not quite ready to, to share all that out just yet. But if you're interested, by all means, reach out to Logan and he can keep you in the loop on, on what's happening on that side. I noticed we are just a minute past at the top of the hour, so why don't we wrap it there? I want to say thank you to, to everybody for attending. Um, always like doing these talks and, and getting these ideas out there. It kind of pushes us to, to think through these concepts that we're building out, so always appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day.